The first thing you want to do is decide which fungi you're going to sequence. I don't have any fresh fungi here today, so I'm going to go through my fungorium and pick eight specimens. Uh, Y8, my thermal cycle has eight wells, so that's just enough for these samples that I've picked out. The other thing you want to do is create a spreadsheet for all your sequences, just so you have a record, because after you've done a few dozen of them, it's going to get confusing. So having a nice spreadsheet where you list what species you thought it was, what the INAT number is, what primers you used, and what it turned out to be is going to be really useful later on. So I put them on a plate in the order in which I put them on my spreadsheet, so I don't get confused. These are all the things you're going to need. Let's go over them very quickly. You're going to have your micro pipettes, you're going to have your tweezers. You're going to um, pour a little bit of alcohol into a shot glass here. Uh, you have your waste container, your sodium hydroxide, um, your TRIS EDTA buffer, um, you're going to have your gloves. Obviously, you will have cleaned the surface on which all of this uh, is on. You're going to have your permanent marker. I pulled out 16 tubes here because we're going to need two sets of eight tubes, and I'm going to um, write on them in just a minute. I have a copy of my protocol. Even though I've done this a lot of times, I often do still forget things or make small mistakes, so it's great to have your protocol right there. Um, these are my pipette tips, and there's a couple of trays here for them. And then finally, here's my centrifuge. What you're also going to need is eight uh, pipette tips with melted tips. And what this is, is really they're like tiny little pestles, because buying pestles um, is quite expensive. Whereas if you make them yourself by melting the tip of a pipette, like this, um, then and that's a lot cheaper. So I'm going to make eight of those. And here they are, eight uh, little pestles that I just made myself. And here are my label tubes. It's two sets of eight. The ones in the back, I close the top because you don't want anything to get in there that could interfere with the PCR. So now we are ready to get started with the extraction part of the process. I follow a protocol that I kind of made up from other people's protocols. I combine them into one that I really like. It's worked for me. It's worked for fresh and dried fungi. It's worked for uh, jelly fungi, for um, softer polypores, softer ascos. It hasn't worked at all uh, for pyranomycetes or other carbonaceous ascomycetes but it's a protocol that's been pretty successful for me so that's the one i'm going to follow what's extraction all about extraction is really about getting the dna out of the cell because the cell doesn't want to yield the dna very easily um, which makes sense um, because it's instructions for building that organism so we need to use all kinds of tools to kind of chisel them out and we're going to use chemicals we're going to use heat we're going to use time and we're gonna use a brute force. Uh, we're gonna grind, uh, grind the mushrooms. So we're gonna do all those different kinds of processes all with the aim of extracting the DNA from the cell. So the first thing I wanna do is um, just grab a tiny little piece of mushroom tissue and put it into a tube. And I'm gonna do that eight times for each of the mushrooms I've got on my plate. Uh, between every single step, I'm going to sterilize my tweezers in alcohol and I'm also going to hold them over an open flame. That's the reason I'm doing it right next to the cooker. So every single time I'm doing that because I don't want any of the samples to sort of cross-contaminate. And I want to make sure it's just a tiny piece of tissue. You don't want to grab anything that's really big. People sometimes say the size of a grain of rice. Honestly, I think it should be even smaller. You really just want something teeny tiny. You grab it with the tweezers. Sometimes it wants to jump around a little bit. You grab that with the tweezers and you put it in the tube. That's the second sample I'm doing. And after every single step, I'm going to put uh, the tweezers over the flame and in the alcohol and then over the flame again, just to make sure it's absolutely clean. And now here I am, I've got eight little tubes and each of them has a tiny little piece of fungal tissue in it. And then the next step is you're gonna add uh, 30 microliters of sodium hydroxide to each one of the tubes. So 
So you take your uh, 20 to 200 microliter pipette and you're going to set that little wheel to three. And you're going to take your larger pipette tips and dip your pipette into it. And then you push, you push down just a little bit um, on the knob on top, not all the way. And you're going to put that into your liquid and then let go. That means it's absorbed exactly 30. Uh, microliters and then you're gonna push down again without touching the tube you're gonna put 30 microliters into that tube and you're gonna repeat that eight times so that each of the tubes gets 30 microliters of sodium hydroxide and after you're done with that you're gonna just uh, drop that pipette tip into the trash by pushing the smaller button it should just come right off because you're not going to use that again. You want to keep your pipette tips closed in the box because once again you don't want to get anything contaminated and once in a while you'll just sort of splash a little bit of alcohol into your gloves to make sure that they're still sterile. And then you're going to take one of your pestles that you made earlier and you're going to put them into each of the tubes, one uh, pestle for every tube, and you're going to grind and move and macerate about 30 seconds the piece of fungal tissue that's in there because you want to turn it almost into some kind of soup you really want to break it down so you're going to do that for 30 seconds and you're going to do that for each one of your samples and like i said make sure you use a fresh pestle for each one because you don't want any cross contamination and when the 10 minutes are over you're going to add a hundred 50 microliters of the uh, Tris EDTA buffer uh, to each of the tubes and you can use the same pipette tip as long as you don't touch the tubes so you have to carefully sort of drop that in without touching the tube so you take the tube you push down on your pipette but not all the way you dip it into the buffer the Tris uh, EDTA buffer right? and then you're going to put that into the tube and you're going to repeat that eight times once you've done that once you've put the buffer into each of the tubes we're going to load them into this thermal cycler because what we're going to do next is a so-called heat block and all that means is we're going to put it into a thermal cycler for 10 minutes at 95 degrees centigrade so that uh, the heat can also help break down the cell walls and liberate the DNA. You're going to load them into the wells just like this and then you're going to close the lid and it should snap close and you can actually tighten it a little bit if you want to if it's not tight enough. So you're going to connect your thermal cycler to your computer and on your computer you're going to have the mini PCR interface in my case. It might be a different interface for you. And I'm, uh, I've just told it um, that I want to run the 10 minute 95 degrees Celsius heat block. So you just sort of press uh, the, the go button and then for 10 minutes it'll heat up the thermal cycler and you can actually kind of hear it. It makes that noise when it heats up. Once you're done with the heat block, it's time to put uh, the tubes into the centrifuge. Take the tubes out of the centrifuge, making sure that the lids are closed because sometimes they can open a little bit. And then you want to pop them into those holes and you want to make sure um, that the centrifuge is balanced. So that means um, you want four on each side because uh, if you don't balance them out, uh, the centrifuge can uh, will spin very unevenly. So you want to pop them all in there. And uh, once you've done that, you're going to look like this. You're going to close the lid. You're going to switch it on. And you're going to set it to 11. That's the speed. And then you're going to start. It doesn't actually have a timer, so you're going to have to watch the time. I usually spin them for about five minutes. Yeah, they're spinning. 